just a few minutes down the road, actually, from where I'm living here in Florence, is a monastery that has its own private Egyptian collection. After speaking to them a little bit, they've agreed to let me come in and film the collection to show it. So, let's go see. For thousands of years, we have been fascinated by intriguing objects from ancient Egypt, as well as sacred texts from biblical times. But who were these people that have captured our imaginations with their specifically curated gods? With their vast belief in death and life, what secrets overlap in the religions within an ancient Italian monastery? Fiesole in Tuscany, the original Etruscan settlement up on the hill overlooking Florence, the city founded by Julius Caesar over 2,000 years ago. Our pilgrimage towards history leads us to the very top of the Serene Hills. Originating in 1225, this Catholic church is part of the Franciscan order. Abandoned by the nuns in 1352, later the Franciscan monks would settle here. Born in 1181, St. Francis was a martyr for Christian charity. He was a custodian for nature, and since 1219, annually on the 4th of October, animals are blessed to honor him. St. Francis led several missions throughout Europe, Africa, and the Mediterranean, leading him to become the patron saint of Italy. Although he lived in tumultuous times for religion, his symbol became the flower, showing the delicate side of his nature represented on the ceiling here. In 1219, during the bloodiest Fifth Christian Crusade, St. Francis went to Egypt to try and wage peace. Many of the priests here at this monastery went following in the footsteps of St. Francesco. And as you can see here is an image of St. Francesco when he went into Africa to go and do missionary work, to go and spread the gospel, things like that. The brothers from this monastery have also done the same going into many countries in Africa, many countries in Asia, including also going to Egypt, which is why they have this very special private collection of Egyptian artifacts here in the monastery. But it's so interesting to see that's basically where it started. Watch hundreds of exclusive history documentaries with a subscription to History Hit. Our goal is to bring you award-winning documentaries that cover the events and figures that have shaped our world all in one place. Delve into the history of the ancients with History Hit's exclusive offering of documentaries. Explore with us the enchanting Temple of Karnak or take a deep dive into the fascinating prehistory of Scotland. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. After meeting with the Sultan of Egypt, St. Francis and his followers were the only Catholics that were allowed to remain peacefully throughout the Holy Land.
In the late 1800s, Albert Einstein stayed several times at the monastery while visiting his sister. The statue of Mary and Jesus was given to the monastery and made by his daughter, Margot. The convent of San Francesco is home to many monks, and in the early 1900s, an extension was built where the friars could take care of the elderly. St. Francis spoke about a life of modesty, and this is reflected in the rooms of the monks. This monastery is also one of the most forward-thinking, having one of the biggest library collections on theology. And today I've been given private access to their collections from around the world. Being built on the remains of an Etruscan fortress, many items were discovered here from 2,600 years ago, including many Greek objects like this beautiful terracotta vase showing Achilles attending to his pesky heel. Of course, this area was occupied by the Romans, but interestingly, Egyptian Ptolemaic coins from the 3rd century BC were discovered here. Adjacent to the monastery's archaeological treasures is a chapel dedicated to Mary and the angel Gabriel who came and told her that she would give birth to Jesus. In the late 1800s, the monks from this monastery did missionary work in Japan, China and India, returning with exquisite treasure. Although fascinating, there are other pieces that I am far more interested in. The display of foreign cultural objects was conceptualized by Ambrogio Ridolfi, a monk from the monastery in the late 1800s. Reaching out to foreign missions, he insisted that this display would teach young monks to respect other cultures. Brought back from Egypt, this page dates from the 1700s and is from a Franciscan monastery in Luxor. This page from the Gospel is written in Old Arabic as well as Coptic. The Coptic language is derived from the original ancient Egyptian spoken language. By the year 300 AD, Egyptians who were practicing the Christian faith, who were under the rule of the Romans, adjusted their ancient language into the now Coptic. Listening to Coptic, it allows us to hear a glimpse of what the pharaohs would have spoken. But like most things with religion, came turmoil. A 200-year war in the Holy Land began, fighting between Islamic, Christian, Catholics and Jews. Medieval swords from Egypt and other war implements. Imagine the bloodshed these have witnessed. When the final pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra, died in 30 BC, the Romans took over the country. Yet many of these Roman emperors depicted themselves in full Egyptian attire, attested by the small clay statue. During the Roman period, 
the last fragile elements of Egyptian culture held on. A civilization so strong that it changed the invaders. Although in a distinctive style, Egyptian funerary practices continued under Roman occupation. At the back of this Roman death mask, the sacred scarab beetle of Egypt holds up the sun. Made from a paste spread onto linen called cartonage, this death mask shows a beautiful Egyptian woman who died during the Roman period. The Egyptian civilization was forever evolving, so this change in style was nothing new. For hundreds of years before the Romans arrived, the Egyptian gods had been adopted by several other civilizations. The Egyptian god of mummification, Anubis, shown in Greek style here. The sister goddesses Isis and Nephthys, adjusted into a more Mesopotamian look. These terracotta figurines date back to around 300 BC, when the Greeks arrived in Egypt. The Egyptians' fervent belief in the afterlife was, and still is, tantalizing to outsiders. This Roman-style tomb figurine harks back to an ancient Egyptian tradition spanning thousands of years. Delicately crafted and glazed in the famous Egyptian blue, these faience figurines are servants for the dead. Each one of these figurines was carefully inscribed with a magical inscription. Those who could afford it had hundreds of these placed in their tomb, and once the person was dead, they could call upon these figurines to make their life in the next world leisurely. They loved their lives so much that they wanted it to continue in the next life and be even better. That is why they took so many objects from this life to carry on to the next. Wine, beer, makeup and grain, even a clay effigy of the person's favorite fruit, a pomegranate. For 5,000 years, the Egyptians wanted to take these objects with them. Each piece of pottery is unique and allows us to date a tomb to a specific period based on the unique art style. A lot of people ask, how was a place lit in ancient Egypt? Very simple answer with clay pots, clay lamps such as these. They would have oil inside with a wick and actually these were used to determine the length of a shift for a tomb worker. So if you were painting a tomb in ancient Egypt, you would have your wick, it was a certain length and by the time the wick ran out, your shift was over. But who were these tomb workers. Fortunately, many were skilled enough to craft their own funerary items, not only for the royals.
the wooden eyes of a humble Egyptian bear witness to today's modern world. They wanted to be recognized by the gods on their journey to heaven, and one way to do this was having your face placed above your mummy. In some cases where they couldn't afford a mask, they had a simple anthropoid wooden coffin where they painted their unique facial features. This unknown man lived at a unique village with the sole purpose of creating the Pharaoh's tomb. And with this knowledge, in his spare time, he had the skills to prepare his next life for himself and his family. Living in the village of Deir al Medina in the early 18th dynasty meant that this small family could enjoy a life of supreme comfort, relatively different to others who would work the land. The men and women of ancient Egypt, who so carefully contemplated every element of their lives and their death, I wonder if they could speak what version of history they would tell us. This little limestone head, once painted with black to show the eye makeup, was the top of a canopic jar which contained the deceased's mummified internal organs to be reanimated once they had reached the afterlife. These wooden faces from 3,500 years ago allow us to feel just that little bit closer to the past. Closer to a group of people that wanted us to know about every element of their lives. A people that wrote down almost everything that they did. A people closer to us than we could ever imagine. The man who helped us learn more about the everyday Egyptian's life is an Italian Egyptologist named Ernesto Scaparelli, and he had a close connection to this monastery. In 1904, Ernesto Scaparelli stayed with the Franciscan monks at the monastery in Luxor during an excavation, where he donated many of his pieces to the monastery to help encourage the understanding of Egyptian culture. Such as this statue of the jackal god Anubis with the falcon god Horus behind. Many of his discoveries were in the village where the tomb workers lived, dear Al Medina. These pieces were from the everyday people. It might not be gold, and treasure as such, but it is invaluable how much information we can learn from these rare, simple pieces. Egypt is a land filled with mystery and strange gods, yet these discoveries help us to realize that they were just like us. This 3,400-year-old woven mat comes from Deir al Medina and was made by the hand of one of the residents. The Ka symbol to the ancient Egyptians meant spirit and was shown as raised hands, linking you to your piety towards the gods. Ernesto Scaparelli may have worshipped a different god to the Egyptians, but the ideals remain very similar. In 1904, on the western bank of Luxor, Ernesto Scaparelli rediscovered 
one of the most pristine tombs dedicated to an incredibly important queen who brought about peace. One of the pieces that I've really, really wanted to see in this private collection is actually a Shabti. I know I'm always talking about Shabtis, but this Shabti is a little bit special. This Shabti was donated by the Italian Egyptologist Ernesto Scaparelli to this monastery. And what's so special about it is, it is a Shabti from Queen Nefertari's tomb, Nefertari the wife of Ramses II. Not many artifacts were found intact in her tomb, apart from a couple Shabtis and a few pots and things like that. And here we have a beautiful Shabti of the Queen. Nefertari's tomb had been raided several times throughout history, taking all of the gold and precious items. However, to me, this small Shabti of the Queen is extremely precious. Created from wood and covered entirely in black perfumed resin. Inscribed with protective texts, these miniatures of the Queen are the only things that remain from her magnificent tomb. Nefertari's tomb had been ransacked by the Christians in around 100 AD, who went in and smashed her sarcophagus and ripped her body into pieces. So much for a queen who wanted to only bring about peace through the land and brokered the first ever peace deal between her husband and the rival Hittites to the north. Nefertari, meaning the most beautiful of them all. A well-respected queen by her peers and by the local population of Egypt. One can only hope that these wooden images of the queen would have helped her to reach a peaceful afterlife and become one with the God of Heaven, Osiris. Her husband elevated her to the highest role in all the land. She was married to a mighty pharaoh with the drive to become Egypt's best warrior and a living god. Ramses II's tomb is unfortunately completely destroyed. It has been affected by flooding and earthquakes. I mean, the Pharaoh's mummy was moved out by the priests during the 22nd and the 23rd dynasty. But we do have some things that were found in his tomb, apart from very much little else. We have a Shabti of Ramses II in the form of Osiris made out of wood, the same material that his sarcophagus was made out of. And on the Shabti, we can see his royal name, Wusar Maed Ra Setapen Ra, the justice of the sun god Ra is justified. The round oval is known as a cartouche and contains the pharaoh's name. On this Shabti, he appears as the god of the afterlife, Osiris. And for many ancient Egyptians, he was the embodiment of Osiris, for he outlived many of the population, living to an age of around 96, when life expectancy was only around 35. Being resurrected by his wife Isis, Osiris became the god of the afterlife and is often associated with the color green. His son Horus is often depicted on the lap of Isis, predating the Madonna and Child statues by 2,000 years.
their devotion to the menagerie of Egyptian gods is unfathomable. Small amulets such as these, made from either faience or bronze, were often worn during life, but more importantly, placed on certain areas of the mummified body to protect them from certain demons. Water from the Nile was the core of life, and amulets to the Egyptian god of the Nile, Hapi, can often be found. Another aquatic deity was Tawaret, the protector of mothers and childbirth. Here on the Faian statue, she holds the child's heart. A mummified crocodile dedicated to the protector of the Nile, Sobek. He had a complex role being a symbol of fertility as well as protection towards the pharaoh, he even possessed healing qualities. The ancient Egyptians did revere cats, as I've stated many times before. Cats were more for the everyday common people, not really for royalty. So what we have here is a cat mummy and most of the time these cat mummies were taken by, were bought by the common people to give to offerings to the cat goddess Bastet to have a peaceful domestic life. Most of the times though the priests cheated these people and inside a cat mummy you'll find it's actually stuffed with various other items including feathers, mud, wood, and there might only be one bone from the cat inside a cat mummy. Judging from the shape of this cat mummy, I'm pretty sure it only has a small essence of the cat goddess Bastet inside. The cult of animal mummy offerings thrived during the Ptolemaic times and was a booming business for the priests. There's only one thing that brings us closer to these ancient people. Their immaculately preserved bodies. In a way, they bring us closer to terms with our own mortality. Very interestingly, on one of the missionary expeditions that this monastery led into Egypt, they were offered a mummy, a full-size mummy of an Egyptian priest. And it's quite strange to have a mummy of an ancient Egyptian inside a monastery in the middle of the Italian countryside. But it does allow for the understanding of different cultures and different religions. It's quite a nice, nice idea, I think. This mummy is an Egyptian male priest and his name is written at the bottom here. This mummy's name is Kem Kara, Kem Kara. So here we see the priest Kem Kara being kept by the priests here in Italy. But this 26th dynasty coffin could not be taken on face value alone. Crafted from cedar wood and brightly painted, with a dedication running down the middle, indicating this coffin belonged to a priest. The face was painted red, indicating a man, yet the titles said it was for the lady of the house. Even the name at the end appeared altered. Was this a man or a woman inside? In 2007, 
the monastery called upon Egyptologists and radiologists to put this question to an end. Not unwrapping the mummy and doing x-rays revealed that the body inside was that of a male priest. Fortunately, a label on one of the bandages had been painted on and was well preserved and revealed his name was indeed Kem Kara. However, 2,700 years ago, when this coffin was crafted, it became common practice to recycle others' burial equipment because of the economic decline. Brilliantly wrapped, he was of some importance, even having his wig separately mummified and placed above his head. The priest Kem Kara had no death mask, however, he had a panel placed above his head with an image of the sky goddess Nut, interestingly facing forward, breaking away from the Egyptian traditional profile view. This panel was placed over his mummy to protect him on his way to the afterlife. Even to today, the sky goddess Nut is watching over the priest Kem Kara. Egypt is filled with magic and mystery, but if we look closer and deeper, we can still see its humanity. Even though this is such a small collection, the pieces are still quite interesting and quite important, actually. And I know a lot of you will have some things to say about this being here in a monastery, but think about the good it can bring, the cultural connections it can teach us.